This is it, and see you in July. Michael Jackson is the undisputed king of pop. A lifetime of innovation and reinvention set him apart from the crowd as one of the greatest artists and performers who ever lived. But on June 25th, 2009, at the age of 50, Michael Jackson would be dead. Fire paramedic 33, what is your emergency? Yes, sir, I need, to, I, uh, I need an ambulance as soon as possible, sir. Okay, sir, what's your address? It's 100 North Carrollwood Drive, Los Angeles, California, 90077. You said Carrollwood? Carrollwood Drive, yes. Yes. At the time of his death, Michael Jackson was on a toxic combination of prescription drugs, enough to send anyone crashing down. But how did the most famous man in the world descend into what the judge called medicine madness. What's fascinating and tragic about the way that Michael Jackson died was the sheer volume of prescription medication that Conrad Murray was administering to him was, was beyond belief. On the day he died, Jackson had been on Propofol, which is an anesthetic which had only be administered by anesthetists, for 60 consecutive days. 3 a.m., June 25th, 2009. Shockingly, Michael Jackson is still awake, even after receiving dose after dose of dangerously strong drugs. 10.20 a.m. With Jackson still awake and in visible agony, Dr. Conrad Murray makes a final, fatal decision. He'd taken quite a severe battering from the press and also through the trial and I just think it just got to him, it really did. It just broke his heart, it killed him. How did it happen? What went wrong? And how did a man gearing up for 50 sold out concerts suddenly die? Join us as we investigate the last 24 hours of Michael Jackson. Whatever you think of Michael Jackson, one thing you have to concede is that he was an extraordinary performer. One of the greatest performers, not just of his generation, but of any generation. Michael Jackson has spent almost his entire life center stage. At just five years old, he was changing the music industry with his brothers as the lead singer in the Jackson 5, jump-starting a solo career where he delivered hit after momentous hit. From Motown to disco to pop, Michael Jackson was unstoppable. Beyond Michael Jackson's talent, what made him kind of go beyond the group uh, was his uh, ambition. You know, he was a student of the craft. And so when he wasn't performing, he was to the side of the stage in the Apollo in the Regal, and he was watching people like James Brown and people like Smokey Robinson and Jackie Wilson. And he, he was watching and learning and picking things up. And so he was such a student uh, of his craft that um, when it was time for him to branch out on his own, he had a lot of ideas. I think deep down everybody was waiting for Michael to go solo, but obviously not saying it. So when we actually saw that he was solo by himself, singing this infectious song that you just couldn't stop singing, 
we were just like, you know, thank goodness, finally, he's on his own. It was like that. It was a real, you know, to go straight to number one with your first solo record after being in a band called the Jackson Fives and doing that on your own, that's pretty impressive. I think what Michael learned very early on in his life was that music and the stage was the place where he felt most at home. Um, and that's where he would escape into. And, you know, when he was in the studio with Barry Gordy and they were going over a song over and over and over, um, you know, it was hard work, but he liked it. You know, he enjoyed the craft. He enjoyed, um, he enjoyed making music. He loved music. He learned very early on how to perform, you know, and how to put on that mask. Even as a child, you know, to once you hit that stage, you know, you perform um, and you become a character. Uh, but behind that, he was, uh, there's no question that he was struggling with a lot of things and struggling to make sense of, of you know, who he was and how to reconcile um, his strange life. But a key event in 1984 would impact the course of Jackson's life forever. January 27th, 1984. Michael Jackson was starring in a Pepsi commercial. The plan was for Jackson to descend a staircase and execute his iconic dance moves. But things took a turn for the worse. When the cameras began to roll, Jackson took his position as rehearsed but the pyrotechnics were ignited too early and struck Jackson, causing his hair and face to burn. The burns caused by the pyrotechnics scarred Jackson for life. The damage to his scalp and face left Jackson with no choice but to pursue plastic surgery, a treatment he would become addicted to throughout his life. It was a huge change for everyone. We couldn't believe his image had changed that much. Michael Jackson had struggled his whole life with his appearance. As a young child, he was abused by his father, bullied by his older brothers, and lived under constant media scrutiny. The very least you can say about Michael Jackson, because it's well documented, he, he struggled with his own identity, you know, his own sexual identity. He was bullied as a child by his father, his brothers. His brothers called him Big Nose. And obviously, later in life, he bleached his skin. He became obsessed with, with bleaching his skin and plastic surgery. And, and, and this is a man whose identity is fundamentally conflicted. You know, he doesn't know who he is, who he wants to be, who he ought to be, who he's trying to please. And, and he's looking for his place in the world. And when you stand up on a stage as grand and, and as the one that Michael Jackson spent his entire life standing on, it's very difficult to get the advice and the support that you actually need. Um, and there's no question that he struggled with that. And the way his body was decimated at the end of his life, both by actions he himself took, the plastic surgery, the bleaching of the skin, together with the internal decimation of his body through the use of prescription drugs and the abuse of those drugs, um, there's no doubt that Michael Jackson's life was a fractured, fragmented life, and that the real story of, 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 of Michael Jackson is really a struggle to find out you know, who he was, you know, and, and to be more than that, to at least come close to accepting who he was, uh, which clearly he didn't. And, uh, and when you are that conflicted, you are in a high degree of emotional pain or distress, call it what you will, but it doesn't make life easy. And when you put your head on the pillow at night, it doesn't make it easy to sleep, and certainly doesn't make it easy to sleep restfully. Michael Jackson's uh, past is, is a difficult one, it's a complex one. And, you know, it's, he's, he's the kind of quintessential child star who's kind of pushed into the business, into show business at a very early age. Um, his relationship with his father was difficult. Um, his father uh, was abusive, uh, both emotionally and physically. And, uh, and that was hard for Michael. I think some of, you know, people respond to that kind of abuse differently. And with some of the other brothers, I think that, you know, it didn't impact them the same way psychologically that it did Michael. 
it really hurt him and he, he carried it throughout the rest of his life you know that his father drove him and pushed him but never treated him like a son in fact they called him joseph they didn't call him dad or daddy or father um, his name was joseph and so it kind of represented that um, emotional detachment i think what the public doesn't know is that he forgave his father for some of the hurt that was caused and at the end of his life, he was very much on good terms with his father. So I think that a lot of the things, like, they happened a long time ago. And, you know, Michael forgave. When, when Michael released Dangerous, it was like he'd gone through a, a new change again, because now his face had changed way more and he'd become even more lighter than before and everybody was starting to question okay what's going on with the skin color do you know this is really odd um i personally believe that no one quite knew if he was actually trying to be white but they all assumed he was trying to make himself white and it, i think it angered a lot of people because people felt he was such a good looking guy and gorgeous. A lot of us were like upset that he was changing his face. We're like, don't change your face, Michael. We love you the way you are. And, but he'd already changed it by the dangerous. And it was like, so that was the controversy that was going on. People weren't quite sure if he was trying to make himself white or um, we could see his nose had changed and things were looking a little bit different. So everyone was a little bit, it was a weird time. He definitely had vitiligo, um, which you know, the, the interesting thing about that is that a lot of people didn't believe him or for a, for, a, for a long period of his career, people didn't even know that he had vitiligo. I think the first time that he mentioned it publicly was to Oprah Winfrey, uh, which was 1993. Um, so when his skin began lightening, people didn't know what to make of it. Uh, and then finally he told people that he had vitiligo and people didn't believe him. Uh, and, you know, it took really until he died and the autopsy report actually indicated that he had vitiligo. Uh, but again, imagine um, being somebody that grows up in front of the world and you have this pretty unusual skin condition uh, and people are saying things like you are ashamed of your race, you know, and you, you don't want to be black, you're trying to be white. Uh, so there were things that, he, that were his choice. I mean, the plastic surgeries were certainly his choice, um, but there were things that weren't his choice. And the skin disorder was not his choice, and it was something that he had to deal with in front of the world. Personally, I actually felt that um, confused about why he would want to be white. I didn't get that. But I think the problem with that episode in his life, I don't think that they were vocal enough about his vitiligo. And and that's sad, because they should have been, because then people wouldn't have been jumping to conclusions and stuff. And I do think that in a way, Michael probably, I think he probably didn't want people to know. Michael Jackson, from a very young age, had the world's eyes on him at all times. Um, and um, unfortunately, when he was really young, um, he suffered a lot of uh, abuse, you know, from his father. His father called him Big Nose. Um, um, you know, when he started to transition into adolescence, uh, he remembered fans seeing him with acne and just being horrified that he wasn't this child, you know, this, uh, this child star anymore. Uh, and that was very traumatic for Michael that, you know, his whole identity was wrapped into um, being a performer and having people love him, his audience, and, and, you know, so when he started, his physical appearance started to change, it was very difficult for him to understand um, how to deal with that. And he, he talks about um, how he used to just go into a closet and cry. And he, it was very, you know, he didn't want to look at himself in the mirror. Um, and he didn't want to go out into public other than when he went onto stage. Um, and so all of that all of those experiences when he was young um, contributed to this kind of um, desire to change his physical appearance. Uh, and he was also an artist and he kind of began to treat his face <laughs> as a work of art. Uh, and he wanted to, you know, he had this kind of 
various ideals of perfection that he was trying to achieve um, physically. And so he, you know, one plastic surgery after another and, and um, you know, his physical appearance just changed over and over again. And, you know, people didn't know what to make of it. Um, but I think, you know, there, there are a lot of uh, complex reasons for why, why he did them. So at that time, it was incredibly confusing for people who'd watched him or, you know, everyone loved him and knew what he looked like. And it was confusing for us to see that he had changed his colour. And it's only later on, obviously, way down the road, like, what, 15 years later, you find out that he had vitiligo, which is a serious skin condition uh, where you completely lose pigment. And I feel that because it was the 80s, Stars were all about mystery then. And people, you know, especially in the industry, didn't want sort of artists to, to... It's not like now, where you know everything about an artist. It was like you didn't get married back then, you didn't have... The artist was supposed to be an enigma. And I don't feel that they thought it was the right thing to tell the public what was really going on with Michael, because they didn't want it to affect, I think, you know, his image and everything else. I, I really believe that, because... You know, when you hear what he says in interviews later on, you know, he he didn't want people to know about all the, you know, the, the vitiligo, the... Not that, I, you know, I just think it, it was traumatic in itself that he was going through that himself. I wasn't there, but I just feel that when you see later interviews with him with Oprah and he opens up and he talks about it, you see that he's traumatised by the fact that he wasn't able to tell people before. And now he's telling everyone everyone is looking at him like he's not telling the truth. And that's really a shame, because now you look back, you realise this guy had... He wasn't, he wasn't well. You know, he had some serious illnesses, you know, the vitiligo, he had the burns from the Pepsi ad, and so he had a lot of plastic surgery to reform, you know, parts of his, you know, head and stuff like that. I mean, there was a lot of... There was a lot of stuff that was hidden. When I first met Michael, he had control in his life. And I think the control started slipping away 2003 onwards, when he sank deeper into despair over the false accusations. And I think that there were a lot of doctors that just barged their way into his life. And just people, he just had so many people around him. And a lot of them, I didn't really understand what they were doing in his life. And I think that they influenced him. And it's like they took control. But something much more sinister began on that day in January 1984. Something that would lead to his early death 24 years later. When he burnt his hair at the Pepsi commercial, he started using painkillers then. He then fell from a stage and broke his leg. He also cracked a vertebrae in his back, and those things have caused him terrible pain. I never saw Michael take even an aspirin when he was with me. Uh, I was absolutely horrified when I found out of the circumstances of his death, um, which became clear in the news. Um, he when I was with him and our families were together, he was always bright, alert, and there was never any question of him being on anything. I think that Michael made certain choices to cope with, with his reality, and some of those choices led to kind of an insulated existence um, by necessity. You know, when he creates Neverland, um, it's, it's a way for him to cope, right? To kind of block out the real world or when he's, you know, taking pain medication. It's a way to kind of block out all of the things that are difficult, you know, all the pain that he's struggling with and, you know, just all the pressures that he's dealing with. And, but unfortunately, there are repercussions to that. You know, when you seclude yourself, when you isolate yourself, or when you, you know, when, when you make some of these choices, there's kind of an inevitability in terms of, um, you know, further isolating yourself from, maybe people that could um, help you or that could at least 
have, uh, you know, you could have a more healthy kind of relationship with. I think prescription drug abuse is common in the celebrity world. I think um, it's very easy to get caught up in being a celebrity and you try and get your body to work for what your heart desires and what your mind wants. Um, on a small scale, I find that even I'm not a celebrity, but even trying to live up to the demand of going to bed when you've got to go to bed and wake up when you've got to wake up, look like you've got to look and do what you've got to do, is a toll. Imagine those who are in front of the camera, big celebrities, I think it's unfair on them. I think it's sad, um, but I think it's a price they have to pay, unfortunately. If they want to go down in history as people that were really icons. And I think the bigger the celebrity, the bigger the price. The first time that I was, that it was actually brought to my attention was in March 2009, when I was at the Landsborough Hotel and um, he requested that I get hold of some medication through my family contacts, because I've got six members of my family in the medical field. Um, and when I went into his bathroom, then that is when I was aware. I saw lots and lots of pill boxes um, and various different medication. Um, in there, there was Demerol, there was Paxil, Zoloft, and um, that made alarm bells ring in my head. I assumed that if it's his suite and his bathroom that they'd be his. I didn't see any name on them, but I assumed that they were his, and in light of what's happened, I'd safely conclude that they were his. I never, ever, ever saw him take anything. And if I had, I would have put a stop to that straight away, but I never did. I was absolutely shocked and, you know, when I saw these things in the bathroom, I wasn't thinking, oh, you know, he's, he's a drug addict or anything like that. I was thinking, maybe he's sick and I wanted to know. But, and I kept on asking him, what, what's happening? And he was like, no, everything's routine, you know, it's all okay. And, um, and that's when I decided to take a few samples. I didn't take the whole lot. I took a few samples of the medication and I took them home so that I'd have time to think carefully and find out what they were and, and see. And that's, you know, that's what I did. And I found out that they were painkillers and antidepressants. It's sad that we wanted so much from the man that we kept saying more, 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 rather than saying, hey, no more from you. Rest up, enjoy your life. Enjoy bringing up your children and, you know, enjoying your home. Rather than saying, what can Michael Jackson do? What can Michael Jackson do? We, I think we drove him to a lot of things. At the time of his death, Michael was taking an almost unbelievable daily dose of prescription drugs, including Demerol, Zoloft, Ritalin, Prozac, Xanax, Dilaudid, Vistaril, and Prilosec. We'll never know the real reasons why Michael Jackson was taking the volume of prescription medication that he was. I mean, he would have said to his friends, his family, his doctors, yeah, I need this medication, I want it, I want it, I need it, I want it, because he was an addict. And that's what an addict does. They'll do anything to get their drug of choice. But as for the, for the, for the doctors, that are, or on the people who were close to Michael Jackson, allowing that to happen, who knows? Who knows why they were prescribing that? It certainly wasn't for Michael Jackson's well-being. Michael Jackson needed to get off those drugs, not to take more of them. He needed to take fewer opioids. He needed to take fewer benzodiazepines. He certainly needed less propofol. But we'll never know what was going through the minds of those people allegedly caring and treating Michael Jackson. One can only assume that, like with so many people that have come before him and so many people afterwards, that the richer and more famous and celebrated you are, the more at risk you are of not getting the advice and support that you need, because people will give you and tell you what you want to hear rather than what you need to hear. And that's the tragedy of Michael Jackson and many others like him.
This cocktail of drugs was placing an enormous strain on Jackson's already exhausted body. But while the prescription drugs may have become habit, mounting pressures outside of the singer's control were beginning to take their toll. Please keep an open mind and let me have my day in court. I deserve a fair trial like every other American citizen. I will be acquitted and vindicated when the truth is told. Although Michael Jackson was cleared of all child sex abuse allegations, the years of public humiliation at the hands of the hounding press left his reputation in complete ruin. The 1993 um, allegations was extremely traumatic for Michael. Uh, he was on tour at the time this is when he developed uh, an addiction to painkillers. It was, it was, he, in his own words, described as a humiliating experience. They did a strip search on him, you know, took photographs of him. They had like 70 police officers go through his property. And what made him angry about it is that they never found anything that would indicate that he was, in fact, guilty. Oh, it took a lot out of him, that. I mean, he, yeah, I didn't eat very well. Um, I mean, can you imagine the pressure he must have been under? And the pressure was enormous for him. I mean, th I mean, of course, we knew that he was innocent of all charges, but, you know, a lot of innocent men have been found guilty and evidence can fall one way or the other. So the, st the stress of three months of going to court every single day. He looked thin, he looked anemic almost. I mean, he was, it was just, I think that really was probably the worst thing in, in his life as far as his health goes and, and his mental state. Yeah, I mean, the trial took a, a lot out of him. I mean, you know, he didn't eat, sleeping very badly. And uh, I really, that probably took 10 years off him, I should think. How everything started to go wrong with Michael Jackson was with the child abuse allegations. And I think when I first heard it, I remember thinking to myself, well, where did that come from? I mean, we all know that he's like a kid. He's a kid himself. So what's that about? So first of all, there was confusion. You're thinking, is it true? Isn't it true? And this was always the general consensus from people that you spoke to was, I'm not sure. And you'd have some people go, I think he did. It's typical. It was this witch hunt. It was a total witch hunt um, by the media, um, already sort of saying that he was already guilty before he was even proven innocent, you know? Um, and I, I, I felt that that's when things started to go down for him in the terms of the public couldn't work out what was true and what wasn't, and that's what was bad. And then when it was settled, an out-of-court settlement, this was what was a, a, a big mistake. Um, fabrications. First of all, I'll say the allegations. Um, that was a, a very fabricated story that when it went to court, you know, found innocent in all charges. Um, you know, not even on an alcohol drink. Um, also, I'd like to say, you know, that there's, there's so many. The pin one, I think, would be unfair. Perhaps there's an ounce of truth in what's written, but it's totally embellished and taken out of context. And I really think that people actually get some kind of kick out of it. They love it. They want to print the truth, you know? And so basically it means that when people do come forward and tell the truth, no one believes them. He'd taken quite a severe battering from the press and also through the trial. And I just think it just got to him, it really did. It just broke his heart, it killed him. Once revered as the pinnacle of musical achievement, Jackson sank into a reclusive lifestyle. For 12 years, he kept a low profile, hiding away and drowning in $400 million of debt. You know, I think that certain people around Michael Jackson cared about him, tried at different parts of his life to help him. Unfortunately, 
When you have that much power, you can surround yourself with the wrong types of people, the people that will just say yes to everything. And so some of the people, including Lisa Marie Presley, who did um, really try to help Michael and kind of had a, a more balanced relationship with him, weren't there in the end, you know, and, and didn't have a place in his life. And so there weren't a lot of people, I, I know that his family tried to help him in certain ways when they could reach him. But it was hard uh, in, in those final years um, for people to kind of get into that um, inner circle and really uh, see what was happening. He was very hurt by um, the misreportings in the press, but I think he, his defense mechanism was actually, was not to read them. Don't let it, you know, they can say, they're gonna say whatever they're gonna say anyway, so just don't read, don't get involved with it. Because I said to him one day, I said, well, why don't you just sue them? And he said, Mark, if I was to sue everyone that wrote something about me that was untrue, I'd be in court every single day. So it just wasn't worth it for him, so he just decided to let it go. To a certain extent, in terms of naive, I think because he has lived a lot of his life in the public eye with all the adulation and all of the fans, I think to a certain extent, perhaps he did he hadn't experienced some of the things that we've experienced in everyday life. So for that, for those reasons, perhaps a little bit naive. Um, and I think that he always wanted to see the best in people. And I think, you know, towards the end, he realised that there are some very bad people out there who don't wish you well at all. And um, in terms of lonely, I would say Michael was lonely. Um, it's not that he didn't have people around him. He had very few people that really understood him and understood what he'd been through, um, the kind of life he had. In fact, there aren't very many people that have been through what Michael's been through. And um, from that point of view, I would say he was very lonely. In what many consider an attempt to offset his debt, Jackson made a deal with AEG Live to perform a series of 50 concerts in a final curtain call at the London O2 Arena. March 5th, 2009. Michael Jackson announces to the world, this is it. This is it. I mean, this is really it. This is the final, this is the final curtain call, okay? And um, I'll see you in July. <laughs> I love you. I really do. You have to know that I love you so much. Really, from the bottom of my heart. This is it, and see you in July. After Michael announced the concerts, he stayed in London and my family came up and we spent the weekend with, with Michael before he flew back to the States. He was in a really good, positive mood. I mean, he was in such a positive frame of mind. Best I've seen him for, for a long time. And it was so reassuring and, you know, we had big plans and he was going to come to London and, you know, it was over the school holidays and the kids were all going to get together and we had loads of time, free time, and we were, things we were going to do and all these plans we had. Uh, he was just so positive. I think he's extremely in control. Um, I think Michael's... I th whether if that was Michael's magic or his madness, um, like they say, I think he was very much in control. And in one hand, it's what brought out this genius. And in the other hand, it's probably what brought out sometimes these um, traps that he fell into um, by not having this management that he would listen to. Um, and I think, you know, that, that there was times when Michael was very much in control. Michael didn't sign up to do 50 concerts. He said that to me, that he only thought he was doing 10. And he wasn't very happy about the fact that it was going to be 50 concerts. And I don't think he knew how he was going to be able to manage it. But the concert rehearsals were not going to plan. Director Kenny Ortega noted that Jackson often didn't show up, and when he did, he was late, weak, 
and fatigued. Michael had problems and he, you know, he felt a lot of pressure. At this time, you know, his finances were in disarray um, and this was his last shot, you know, and the This Is It tour, you know, it really was, I mean, he was feeling an enormous amount of pressure and he felt desperate to be able to sleep, you know, to be, just to be able to get on that stage and feel like he could do it. Uh, and so there was an enormous amount of pressure and there was a lot of money involved and, you know, and certainly Michael made choices, you know, but at the same time, uh, there's this doctor that had an ethical responsibility, even when he's giving him this propofol to monitor him, to not leave the room, you know, to have just basic kinds of, of things that you would expect. Um, and, and those things weren't there. I mean, I, I, you know, Michael didn't want to die. I mean, he had three kids and, uh, you know, certainly, um, he made choices, but, um, you know, it's, it's tragic. It's, a, it's a tragedy. June 22nd, 2009. As the first of 50 nights of performing gets closer, Michael Jackson is battling immense pressure. His body is struggling after years of prescription drug addiction and medical surgery, but the world expects to see Jackson as they remember him, the king of pop. In his Beverly Hills mansion, Jackson is unable to fall asleep. At his bedside, Dr. Conrad Murray. Dr. Murray knew that the propofol he was administering to Jackson was incredibly dangerous and had attempted to reduce his dependency on the drug by giving him a lower 25 milligram dosage. After taking the anti-anxiety drug Ativan and the sedative Versed, Jackson finally falls asleep. June 23rd. Dr. Murray again administers Ativan and Versed to help Jackson sleep. 10 p.m., June 24th. At the Staples Center in downtown Los Angeles, Jackson arrives three hours late for rehearsal. The show was already running behind schedule, but that evening, according to eyewitnesses, Michael Jackson gave an incredible performance, and it seemed as though the king of pop was finally getting back on form. Michael's dancing and he's, he's totally focused. He knows exactly what he's doing and he's doing great. And, you know, I just believe he was in the wrong hands. I, I disagree with everyone who says that he wasn't gonna be up for the shows and up to it. He's a perfectionist, he would have been fine, but he needed to be taken care of. This is, um, he's an artist. You have to, you know, they have to have special care, you know, and, and I don't think he had it. Uh, the movie came about using the rehearsals and using the production and the direction and, and the input that Michael had. And they wanted to show people, look, this man was definitely up for it. it focused, energy. He was up for, for what was ahead. He was looking forward to it. And I think the movie was a very good move by AEG to say, look, the man put so much into this, he would want the world to see what he was doing, what he can do. And I think it was a good move for the fans and it was a good move for Michael. An extraordinary thing, especially to those who don't understand how you can develop tolerance to drugs, is that on June the 24th, the day before his death, Michael Jackson, during rehearsal, gave by all eyewitness accounts, an absolutely extraordinary performance. So despite the fact that that time he'd gone on propofol for 60 consecutive days, that he had this fast cocktail of drugs inside his body, he was still able to perform, and not just to perform well, but to perform to a level that many other artists could only, or most other artists could only dream of. Whatever you think of Michael Jackson, one thing you have to concede is that he was an extraordinary performer. One of the greatest performers, not just of his generation, but of any generation. And his final performance, the performance on the eve of his death, bears witness to that perhaps more than any other performance he ever gave.
1 a.m., June 25, 2009. At Michael Jackson's Los Angeles home, Dr. Conrad Murray sat by the star's bedside as Jackson lies awake in bed, unable to sleep. Jackson begs Dr. Murray for a dose of propofol to send him to sleep. And at first, the doctor resists. After 60 consecutive nights of administering the drug, Murray tries to stand his ground, but Jackson continues to beg, expressing his agony and discomfort. Finally, Dr. Murray surrenders and administers Jackson the propofol. 1.30 a.m. Despite having been administered propofol, Jackson is still awake. His excessive use of this highly dangerous drug has left his body almost immune to its effects. Dr. Murray gives Jackson 10 milligrams of Valium and waits by his bedside. What's fascinating and tragic about the way that Michael Jackson died was the sheer volume of prescription medication that Conrad Murray was administering to him was, was beyond belief. On the day he died, Jackson had been on propofol, which is an anesthetic which should only be administered by anesthetists, for 60 consecutive days. I should imagine that for a minute. 60 consecutive days of propofol. And still he could not sleep. And that's because, like with all drugs, prescription drugs, synthetic drugs, illegal drugs, natural drugs, whatever type of drug you are taking, the brain develops tolerance. So the effect you get when you first take the drug is not the effect you get for the, on the hundredth or the two hundredths or the five hundredths or the thousandth time. So you need more and more and more and more of the drug. And the pleasure and relief you got from taking the drug to begin with turns into pain and distress. So you take the drug no longer for pleasure but simply to stop feeling pain. Michael Jackson undoubtedly was in extraordinary uh, emotional pain and stress because of his lifestyle, his life and, and the comeback tour. And also he was putting an enormous physical stress on his, on his body. So he had physical pain and emotional pain to contend with and he just wanted to sleep. Three a.m. Shockingly, Michael Jackson is still awake even after receiving dose after dose of dangerously strong drugs. Dr. Murray proceeds to administer two milligrams of Versed by an IV drip. 7 a.m. Disturbingly, Jackson is still awake. Dr. Murray strongly affirms that he spent the night by Jackson's bedside, monitoring his pulse and oxygen levels. Dr. Murray administers a further dosage of Versed through Jackson's IV. But even that was not enough to, to send uh, Michael Jackson to sleep. So over the next few hours, the, the last few hours of Michael Jackson's life, he was administered with benzodiazepines, with central nervous system depressants, sedatives of one sort or another, intravenously, until he drifted off into sleep, unconsciousness, and eventually death. 10.20 a.m. With Jackson still awake and in visible agony, Dr. Conrad Murray makes a final, fatal decision. He administers a further 25 milligrams of propofol to Michael Jackson. The King of Pop finally falls into a deep sleep. 11.30 a.m. The powerful cocktail of drugs inside Jackson's body has now become lethal, and he goes into cardiac arrest. So Michael Jackson might have struggled for breath. Slowly, he might have suffocated, gradually losing consciousness until the moment came when his heart stopped. 12.26 p.m., an unidentified man makes the 911 call to the LAPD. Fire paramedic 33, what is your yeah. emergency? Yes, sir, I need to, uh, uh, I need an ambulance as soon as possible, sir. When the 911 call came, uh, our firefighters at our dispatching center, which is located four floors below the uh, city hall, down in the, uh, the, the catacombs, you will, of the city, they took a 911 call that shocked the world. Okay, sir, what's your address? It's 100 North Carrollwood Drive, Los Angeles, California. 90077. You said Carolwood? 
Carol Woodrod, yes. Unfortunately, at the time, the dispatcher answered the phone call and, and never once did the caller ever identify to the Los Angeles Fire Department that the person that needed our help was Michael Jackson. Okay, sir, what's the phone number you're calling from? Okay, sir, sir, and what's the phone number exactly what happened? Uh, sir, I have a, we have a, a, a gentleman here that needs help, and he's not breathing yet. He's not breathing, and we need to. We're p trying to pump him, but he's not. He's not okay. Breathing, okay. How old is he? He's uh, 50 years old, sir. 50. Okay. He's unconscious. He's not breathing. Yes, he's not breathing, sir. Okay, and he's not conscious either. He's not no, breathing. he's not conscious, sir. Okay. Once the uh, dispatcher got information uh, about the patient and what was happening with the patient. Uh, the identifier said that the patient was pulseless and non-breathing and that a doctor was on the scene doing CPR on the bed. So part of our instructions, as already our firefighters and paramedics are responding, we still have a firefighter on the phone with the caller giving directions to give life-saving techniques to the uh, people that could help. All right, do you have him? Is he on the floor? Where's he at right now? He's on the bed, sir. He's on the bed. Okay, let's get him on the floor. Okay. Okay, let's get him down to the we floor. I'm going to help you with CPR right now, okay? We need him. We need him. Yes, we're phone. already on our way there. We're on our way. I'm going to do as Thank much you, as I can sir. to help you over the phone. We're already on our way. Did anybody see him? Yes, we have a personal doctor here with him, sir. Oh, you have a doctor there? Yes, but he's not responding to anything. To No, no he's not responding to CPR or anything, sir. Oh, okay. Well, we're on our way there. If your guys are doing CPR and you're instructed by a doctor, he has a higher authority than me. And he's Thank there you. on scene. Okay. Um, did anybody witness what happened? Uh, no, just the doctor, sir. Paramedics arrive at the scene, but Dr. Murray can no longer detect a pulse. I was uh, told that uh, Michael Jackson was being transported to UCLA Hospital on June 25th, and the Fire department uh, was on scene at Michael Jackson's house three minutes and 17 seconds. From the time that the emergency 911 call came on June 25th to when it came to the fire station, from the firefighters getting out of the fire station to the address where Michael Jackson was, was three minutes and 17 seconds. We worked on Michael Jackson for approximately about 48 minutes. And once the uh, the fire department realized that it was now proper to transport our patient, Michael Jackson, to the hospital. They were 2.3 miles away, but he worked about 45 to 48 minutes. We worked 45 minutes because as paramedics, we call it the golden hour. And the firefighters, paramedics can pass medications, can do life-saving techniques to help our patients. We're in contact with our base station, which is a UCLA, giving us medical direction on what type of medicines we could give our patients to help them survive. 2.26 p.m., June 25th, 2009. The legend of Michael Jackson comes to a shocking end. He is pronounced dead at the Ronald Reagan UCLA Medical Center. Oh, it was devastating. It was like the world paused. I, I just can't actually believe it. It still feels like it's like it's a really bad dream. It hasn't really sunk in. It just doesn't feel, it doesn't feel real. It just, it feels all wrong. Well, I was just, I was actually in my room and I was watching something on one of the other channels and I got a phone call and a friend of mine said, have you seen the news? And I said, what do you mean? He just put the news on. So I flicked over and of course, it said Michael was admitted to hospital and then it just got from one bad thing to another and and then he was pronounced dead and it was, I mean, I just couldn't believe it. I thought it was in a dream, I was going to wake up, it was all a big joke. It was just, I just couldn't absorb it. It was just horrible. My, this happened, I think, UK time around two o'clock in the morning and my kids were upstairs and I thought, well, do I go up and tell her? I said, no, 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 I let them sleep. They have to get up for school in the morning. And I, well, I, I went up and knocked on their door and I said, look, I've got something really awful to tell you. And I told them and, you know, they just broke down and floods of tears. So it was really, that's what, you know, hit me, hit me then really. Everybody felt a connection, whether you liked him or not. 
you grew up with something, you remember the song, you connected. It could be a dance with your partner, whatever it is. It was at a place that you first heard when Thriller came out. You was upstairs on the BB, I don't know, whatever it was. And they felt there was a certain element of loss. Something, whether they liked him or not. Ever since I was born, Daddy has been the best father you could ever imagine. <laughs> and I just wanted to say I love him so much. But the question on everyone's lips is, why did this happen? And the second question, who is to blame? He got in a bad situation, you know? He got in a bad situation where, um, you know, he had developed a dependency on um, certain prescriptions, including propofol, which wasn't supposed to be used in the way that it was being used. And unfortunately, uh, there were doctors, including um, Dr. Conrad Murray, who weren't directing him to the kind of um, help that he actually needed, you know, whether his symptom, whether he needed help sleeping or whether he was having anxiety or, you know, these different things that he was saying that he was, that he needed help with, um, you know, instead of getting what he needed, um, you know, they were using these very unusual, dangerous methods to address those. And, you know, he's building up for this big comeback tour and his doctor's putting him to sleep every night with propofol. Uh, which is usually used for surgery, you know, uh, and it's extremely dangerous. And so Michael Jackson died because of what had happened throughout his life, which is that the people around him um, viewed him for what they could what they could get from him. You know, in this case, the doctor was getting one hundred fifty thousand dollars a month, um, and was being extremely reckless. It was gross neglect. You know, and this, this was not someone that I would trust as my doctor. And that's all I really will say about that. Someone like Michael Jackson should have had a proper doctor, not someone, you know. In America, it's very much a, a problem, I believe. I find that, you know, you can pretty much get your hands on lots of prescriptive drugs and things like this. This is why Hollywood has so many problems with drugs. So I would just put it down to gross negligence, you know? What Conrad Murray should have done, if he is putting Michael Jackson into, in effect, a drug-induced coma, which is what he was doing, he is, he, is, he is putting Michael Jackson to sleep with a vast quantity of prescription medication, then that needs proper monitoring. And he was not qualified to do that. He wasn't qualified to do it. So, so he was gambling, really, with Michael Jackson's life and doing what Michael Jackson wanted him to do simply because he was afraid not to. Perhaps because he had problems in his own life. I think there were well-documented issues that Conrad Murray had with debt and his own personal financial situation. So Jackson wasn't a patient he could afford to lose. But of course he lost him, and he lost him in the worst possible way. Voluntary manslaughter, a felony, Dr. Murray. How do you plead? Your Honor, I am an innocent man. I therefore plead not guilty. The facts in this case, in my view, suggest that virtually none of the safeguards for sedation were in place when propofol was administered to Michael Jackson. It's an egregious violation. No competent physician would give these drugs without having emergency airway equipment present well, I, I, I think it was just a, an awful accident where, you know, medication that was used that shouldn't have been used, um, unsupervised, and that kind of medication is only used in hospitals as far as I know. And um, he should have been on some kind of monitor, but he shouldn't have been given it in the first place. Um, unfortunately, if you pay 
What's the saying? He who pays the piper calls the tune, and if Michael wanted that, he'd find someone, he'd pay him enough to do it. And um, sadly, that, um, that took his life away. I wished he had the opportunity of having a life for himself and letting the children grow up and say, you know, Dad, so he can sit back, and whether they perform or whatever, I think for him to enjoy something that he never had. It felt like from the day he was born to the day he died, he entertained. If that's the way he wanted it, then good for you. But if, if he wanted some, some privacy, I don't think he got enough of it. Um, I don't think it was fair. I think we should respect him and honor him for what he gave musically. You know, what's getting lost here is that Michael Jackson is an incredible artist, you know, and artists aren't always normal, you know. In fact, some of the greatest artists are, are very eccentric, very unique, very different, and Michael's no different. Michael was a great artist. He uh, lived his life in a different way, in an unusual way, provoked a lot of questions. But when we go back to those songs, when we go back to those videos, when we go back to those albums, we find just an incredibly rich, diverse array of art um, that deserves attention. You know, for all the scandals, for all the eccentricities, Michael was an artist and he wanted to be remembered as an artist. In fact, one of his last quotes in 2007 was uh, a quote from Michelangelo. And he says, to escape death, I, I bind my soul to my work. And the question everybody asks in any death, but in especially the death of one of the 20th century's most iconic figures, is who is responsible? Who can we blame? And obviously, Conrad Murray was the fall guy, and rightly so. You know, there's no question that he played a contributing role in Michael Jackson's death. But so did Michael Jackson's family? Did Michael Jackson's father play a role in his death? Did the many people who, who allowed Michael Jackson to, to go down the road he, he went down play a role in his death? Of course they did. But, and here's the but, ultimately, you cannot take a drug or a drink by accident. Yeah, you have to either ask someone to administer it for you or you have to administer it yourself. And the only hope that any addict has is that they see that they are responsible for their own actions. Because the more we allow an addict to pass the responsibility for their addiction onto someone else, the more impossible recovery becomes. So if we were to really say, who is ultimately to blame? One has to point the finger at Michael Jackson himself. Not in a harsh, judgmental sense, but just in the sense that other people watching that story that they need to learn what they need to do. If they are suffering through similar problems, they know what they need to do to recover, which is to take responsibility for their own addiction. Do not make it somebody else's fault. Otherwise, the addiction will kill you. Michael Jackson was an icon, a legend, the king of pop. But the real tragedy of Jackson's death is a lesson in the price of fame. When you can have everything in the world, who can stop you if you can't stop yourself? <laughs>